May I please have the housekeeping slide? Thank you. All right, good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you to the ASEAN Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform webinar series. Today is our the fourth webinar on circular fashion, sustainable consumption and production across textiles, leather, and cosmetics. And this webinar series is a co-host between ASEAN Circular Stakeholder Platform and the EU Switch Asia Policy Support Component. Before we start today, I'd like to take us over the housekeeping rules of our webinar. First of all, I'd like to kindly ask all participants to keep your microphone mute so that the session is not interrupted. And please be advised, advised that the webinar is being recorded throughout. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop the question into the chat box and our speakers or our moderator will get to your questions or um, feel free to drop an email to us to follow up with the email after the webinar as well. So to begin um, this webinar, I like to warmly invite um, our chair, Dr. Anthony Pramonrat and Mr. Three Suit Ariyawat or Kun David to give an introduction to us. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Sirosa. Uh, my name is Anthony, and uh, we are at the ASEAN Center for Sustainable Development Studies and Dialogue. We host the ASEAN Circular Economy uh, Stakeholder Platform, and I'd like to give a warm welcome to good morning or and good afternoon uh, to all of the distinguished guests here today. The, this session will explore various aspects of circular fashion, including sustainable materials and production, processes for textile, leather, and cosmetics, uh, the role of design in extending garment lifespans, the rise of secondhand clothing, you know, and rental models as alternatives to traditional consumption and patterns, initiatives and best practices for promoting circularity within, within the ASEAN region. Today, we have quite a distinguished panel of guests ranging from a, a broad spectrum within, within the industry. And without further ado, I'd like to ask my colleague, uh, David, just to give a brief introduction of what our circular economy stakeholder platform consists of. And I'd like to invite, take this opportunity to invite you to visit the website and also um, provide your best practices uh, with, within the website. David. Thank you so much, Dr. Anthony. First and foremost, I want to express my humble gratitude to all speakers, moderators, contributor and participant to this webinar. Most importantly, I would like to thank you for the Switch EU Switch Asia policy support components support in making this webinar happen. And let us explore how we can transform the fashion industry into a force for positive change. And thank you so much for being a part of this important conversation. Now, let me briefly share about the ASEAN Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform. As many of you have heard about and or participate or contributed to our event already, our platform was established as a regional facility with a mission to help ASEAN member states achieve sustainable consumption and production by accelerating a transition to a circular economy. It is a part of the ongoing ASEAN EU partnership on circular economy. The establishment of our platform was inspired by the success of the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform, our bigger sister platform. And by learning from European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform and other similar regional initiatives, we support ASEAN transition to a circular economy by providing access to good circular economy practice strategies to our knowledge and information portal or our website, Dr. Anthony just mentioned earlier, and facilitating stakeholder engagement, organizing events, as well as annual circular economy conference for the ASEAN region. And on this occasion, I encourage you to engage with our platform to learn from diverse knowledge, news, and events 
share your stories, good practices, business case, and engage in meaningful activities and collaboration. In addition to your engagement with our knowledge portal, we are also setting up our engagement group, which consists of circular economy thoughts or action leaders from different sectors in this region. So if you believe in what we do and which is to contribute to the circularity transition to the textile, leather or cosmetic industry in ASEAN and beyond, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Again, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tani and Kun David. Next, we have our introduction session on understanding fashion footprint. Please welcome Ms. Elodie Maria Soup, our key expert on EU policy development and partnership building at the Switch Asia policy support uh, component. Um, please be mindful that Elodie is actually on a train right now. So um, if her connection drops off, um, our team leader, Sina Ida, will, will um, jump in. So please welcome Elodie. Thank you so much, Dr. Sirata. And on this word, I will cut my video to just save a little bit of, uh, of internet for, uh, so, so you can focus on the presentation as well. Um, so I will introduce this uh, presentation, which focuses on the footprint of the textile sector globally in the ASEAN, in the EU, and at the end with a little focus on Switch Asia, our, our program that partners with as the answer network. So textile is literally woven into our lives. It provides a lot of employment, it generates revenue, and it's essential to human beings. We all need clothing, but it is far from sustainable. It uses a lot of water, it creates pollution. It's also the source of the microplastic losses in the oceans. And this is not only because of the way we produce plastic, but also the way we consume it, as we estimate that we're using much less the textile items that we consume now. We, we discard them much faster than we used to. This graphic from Ellen MacArthur Foundation illustrates this, this um, decrease of clothing utilization. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. That's all right, maybe it took time for me to see it. Um, and we estimate that actually every second, one truckload of clothing is burned or landfill. So we can imagine all the natural resources that are wasted and the impact on ecosystems, but also all the economic opportunities that are lost by just putting these materials back into waste. Next slide, please. Uh, there was a report not so long ago on fashion sustainability and it's, uh, it's modeled in Southeast Asia. So the linear model, the model where you, you take, you use, and then you waste, that's what's called more linear. Uh, it, it actually has a very important economic role in Southeast Asia. It's a high uh, proportion of exports for Cambodia, the garment industry. It's a, a high proportion of uh, GDP in Vietnam. Uh, and also it's, it's a big market in Indonesia, but the textile industry also has big social impacts, human rights abuses, and environmental de degradation is very commonplace, especially in, in water bodies. Next slide, please. The, so everyone believes that there is a systemic change needed. Uh, UNEP recently issued a, a report in 2023, I believe, uh, identifying three interconnected priorities to deliver this change. It's not only about the consumers, it's not only about the businesses, it's not only about the infrastructure, it's about all these three elements coming together. So if I, as a consumer, decide to buy less and to consume less textile or better and make use them longer, my, my textile, um, elements I have. I, it's also good if they're made out of recycled material or if they're made to last longer. Uh, that helps me as a consumer and that's more in the improved practices. Uh, but businesses also need uh, more infrastructure to make that happen and and consumers need the infrastructure also to to discard the waste in a, in a proper manner. 
So it's all it's all parts of an interconnected and circular chain. Next slide, please. The EU has taken some steps to, to change uh, the way textiles are produced and consumed through its uh, strategy on sustainable and circular textiles. Out of this strategy that was adopted, I believe, about five to six years ago, laws have come out recently, such as the Eco Design and Sustainable Products Regulation, adopted last year at the end of last year, which means that every piece of clothing will now have to be made of recyclable materials, last longer, uh, a lot of elements will be embedded in each textile material before it enters the EU market. But also the EU makes it easier for consumers to know that when they buy something that is uh, marketed as green, that it actually is green because now producers have to substantiate their claims. They have to follow scientific formula say that something is actually green. Um, and then the EU is also taking a lot of steps to reduce the shipment of uh, textile waste to other countries and better reuse their waste to extend producer responsibility. So also uh, doing their own homework to better manage their textile waste, which is much needed. Next up, next slide. Sustainable fashion in the ASEAN is growing. Uh, the report that I mentioned previously estimates at first that fashion is a fast growing market in the ASEAN, especially in Vietnam, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore. And we have representatives from most of these countries here today. Um, and it represents a market beyond $50 billion now. But sustainable fashion is also happening in ASEAN small scale, more locally run businesses. We have excellent examples today as well. And also through bottom up initiatives and through like the SWAP project in Malaysia and I think it's active in Thailand as well. Next slide please. I give you time to think between each of these slides. Read So the EU switch HR program uh, has been working in the tech sector for some years now. It exists actually since 2007, the switch HR program is active not only in ASEAN, but other countries of Asia and Spanish and Pacific. And uh, it has two components, the policy support component. Today you see our team, who are team leaders in IDA, but it's a colleague Ray. Hello. Elodie, are you still with us or are you finished with your session? The presentation is not over yet, so there's some interruption. Siras, I can continue. Uh, apologies, colleagues. When and if uh, Elodie able to join, uh, she will uh, continue the presentation. But EU Switch Asia program uh, aims at low carbon resource efficient circular economy. Uh, many of you have been working with us in different capacities. And the main uh, point here, which uh, is that we are working through dif uh, two different directions. One is a policy support component, which is really about helping the regions and countries to develop policies, frameworks, uh, roadmaps, which would uh, help to uptake SCP, Sustainable Consumption and Production Practices. And there are also grant projects which allow to model the, um, uh, the activities of the, uh, of the SCP and circular, circularity on the grounds by the groups of uh, SMEs uh, and the consumer and consumer organizations. So the idea here is not to show one of uh, good practice, but really to mainstream the practices as much as possible. Uh, next slide, and while a slide is uh, uh, changing, let me check if uh, LED is back with us. If not, I am continuing then. Uh, so we are uh, happy to present um, uh, examples uh, which could be found on the website of, of Switch Asia. Sarah, may I just ask you maybe to show, share at this moment 
reference to the good practices of the grants on the Switch Asia websites. Uh, 21 uh, EU uh, financial uh, grants were financing in the textile and fashion sector since beginning of the operations of Switch Asia. Five of those projects are in ASEAN and still one of them is uh, ongoing. By the end of this year, we are hoping to have the new crop of uh, grants. So you could see them uh, here on the screen uh, in Myanmar, in Cambodia, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, <coughs> quite a number of these excellent uh, activities focusing either on the efficiency of materials or efficiency of uh, uh, and circularity of uh, energy or combination of those. Next one, LOD, are you back? If not, I'm, I'm back. Excellent. Sorry, there was a so, Then <laughs> you can take over from here. And this is quite yeah. exciting uh, point uh, because uh, two of the persons who are uh, working on these two cases are with us today and uh, they're going to speak. LOD. Yes, it's an initiative that you know very well. Zenaida could go in, in Malaysia at the moment uh, for this initiative. Uh, you know, Switch Asia has gathered a number of circular business cases in the ASEAN over the past months, and uh, they are presented, two are presented here today, but also uh, more are available on our website if you want to find out about more circular business cases and what it means to be a textile circular business case in the ASEAN. Uh, and we'll, we'll hear from them very, very shortly, so I, I won't dive too much into it. Next slide, please. I think we'll, this was the end, and we're moving on to the first panel. And I'll pass the floor to Dr. Sirasa to introduce the, the speakers, and then I'll take back as a as a moderator for this panel. Thank you thank, for your patience thank you, with the panel. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Elodie. So our next panel, um, we have a panel discussion on sustainable consumption and production strategy for circular fashion, which will be led by Elodie again as the moderator. Joining her in the panel, we have Arjun Lan, CEO from Pactix, and we also have Adi Reza, the founder of Microtech Lab. Please welcome our speaker and Elodie back to the spotlight. Thank you so much, Sirasa, and I'll put on my video, taking the risk of looking a little bit robotic, uh, but uh, to so that people can see me while I ask the questions. I'll start with uh, with Adi, if you don't mind, Adi. Uh, now you'll take the floor first, and asking you two questions. Um, if you could explain to us what strategies you have used in your business to move towards circularity. So maybe after introducing a little bit your business, what it is that makes your business circular, even if it's not completely circular, what it is that, that are elements of circularity, and how would you define circular fashion? What is circular fashion? I'll leave the floor to you now, Abby. Yeah, so, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks, Elodie. Uh, uh, so, I'm Adi from NYCL. So, NYCL itself is we develop uh, biomaterials, high performance and sustainable biomaterials from mushroom mycelium. One of the application is for fashion and automotive industry. So for example, here in my hand, it's not leather, but it's better. We try to converting agricultural waste that is quite abundant in Southeast Asia, which sometimes end up to be uh, land burn and keep causing haze to our neighborhood, country neighborhood. And MYCL try to mitigate that by converting this agri crop waste into something that has more added value using mushroom mycelium technology. So in terms of the circularity, we try to uh, preventing the agri crop waste end up in the land and burn uh, into more valuable products. Um, and um, we, in our point of view, um, sustainability itself is not only um, creating products that is eco-friendly, but also uh, creating product that create benefits to, uh, to the society. In our case there is, uh, we work with several farmers in our supply chain, uh, works with the uh, agri crop waste supplier, uh, mushroom farmer supplier, uh, to work with us creating these uh, amazing products. On the other hand, uh, we work with Pakistan leather goods manufacturer, 
um, designers in order to access, uh, give them access of um, sustainable products, which currently quite difficult for them to access them, only able to be accessed by big company brands, but somehow these small medium brands uh, somehow, uh, somehow can create a, a, a sim or good quality product using these materials. Elodie, are you with us? Sienaida, would you like to step in? Uh, surely, uh, apologies, colleague Arian. Can I pass the similar question to you, please? Um, yeah, so uh, I first want to be a, a bit of, make a bit of a disclaimer with the, the chances that it will be kicked out of this panel, but I don't see ourselves as a really circular uh, economy uh, company, but we're trying to do our best to do a couple of things. And that is, uh, we, we make uh, travel and luggage and eyewear uh, products, uh, millions of pieces uh, world, for, for worldwide export. Um, and we try to reduce the waste significantly, uh, big programs for that. Uh, we try to use recycling uh, materials and we try to reuse the waste also there we can. But there is also enormous challenges, to be honest, uh, to, to get it one step further than only those three steps I, I just mentioned. And that's why I feel a little bit uncomfortable sometimes to mention the word uh, uh, circular, because I think there's much more to do uh, that we possibly could also do in Cambodia, but uh, that will take a, a little bit more time. Uh, but that certainly should be done in the industry. Right, but uh, we don't think ourselves that uh, there are any truly circular companies at the moment, but what is really important is that there is a journey, an ambition to continue. What we speak about circularity is initial areas and direction and consistency in growing ambition rather than doing one off and keep having it as a greenwashing plug. We certainly appreciate the work you are doing uh, also with uh, waterless uh, uh, printing and uh, all of the other technical um, work. And colleagues online, uh, please be aware that uh, both of the uh, cases from MYCLs, well, uh, uh, MYCL are going to be soon published and promoted. We are at the final stages of um, of framing it and uh, uh, the uh, plastic uh, plastics is uh, the ca case which is already uh, up on the website and has, um, I must say, incredible resonance. For example, among the audiences now are in, in Malaysia where I am to have a consultation with the experts uh, among the businesses uh, identifying their cir circular practices. Yeah, so your disclaimer is very well received, but we we, we hooray um, consistent efforts and, as you said, uh, finding the new opportunities uh, towards uh, uh, more and more uh, actions. Um, so uh, the second question, which I would like to ask both of you is uh, more about the drivers, uh, which either open opportunities for you or push you uh, towards uh, finding the new uh, new uh, circular uh, models as a technical or uh, or uh, business. So which policies drive your changes or what practices or what trends drive your changes? Adi? Yeah, sure. So the, we see from our experience the main drive, there are three main drivers. Uh, the first one is the environmental consciousness. We see a lot of growing awareness about the environmental impact of fast fashions, uh, prompting customers to seek sustainable alternatives. That's one. And then the second one is the ethical considerations. Like there's a lot of increased uh, concern for workers' rights, fair labor practice. In our case, is animal abuse uh, in the fashion industry is influencing uh, for consumer choices. And then the third one is the innovations and technology. So uh, the advancement in sustainability, sustainable material like mycelium leather uh, offer consumer high quality and eco-friendly alternative. For example, like 
we can beat the same leather texture without using any uh, plastic or even the uh, post treatment process doesn't require any harmful chemicals. Um, and, and, and on top of that, we can also offer them the same performance quality uh, using uh, compared to the uh, conventional leather in the market. Excellent. Thank you, Adia. Arian. Um, yeah, I think a couple of, I think there is a, a, first of all, an intrinsic driver, which means that basically I always hate it when I see, we have, of course, cutoffs, the post-industrial waste. Uh, that is the cutoffs when you make uh, whatever product uh, and that cannot be used anymore. Um, and, and you have to ship it out every now and then in big containers. It's going to be incinerated. And actually, it is first-class material that's never used. Uh, but there is no no other use to it now than only incinerate. So that makes me always a bit angry because I think it's it's valuable stuff. It's it is worth. We alone, and we are a relatively small company. We we probably burn around three to four hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, so it is the money part, but it's also the environmental part where basically um you don't do anything useful with that with that material well it could be um so that's one uh, i think the other one and and as you are a business i think it's also a business model if you can work more clever and better and reduce less material uh, with less impact uh, for the environment or people then that is also a plus eh? and then i think third there is uh, to a certain extent, uh, also uh, sometimes drivers from from customers who want something new or different, and they come and request for uh, specific things. We also made some bags from, um, let's say, a vegan leather uh, kind of things. So that these are kind of trends. It is quite difficult to to apply that on an industrial scale, on a small scale that still works. But if you're going to make it bigger. It, it 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 grinds a little bit to a stop um but that is a, a matter of time it's a matter of investments also uh, uh, experience uh, and then eventually we'll get there so i think these are the three main drivers and if i ask you arian and adi uh, uh, an opposite question what would be the uh, what is at the moment because i i i listen to your words about it's a matter of time but what is at the moment your biggest barrier for, for upscaling significantly your operations? So I can hear that you are doing it in different countries now, Arian, but what would allow you to do it except investment? Investment is, of course, yeah, but investment is a matter of so many factors, so it would be a simple answer. So what is your biggest barrier at the moment? Yeah. So in our case, um, the hurdles uh, that consumers face in adopting circular fashions is one of our barriers. Um, so for example, uh, when we're talking about B2B, uh, we often get bully from big brands. <laughs> so for example, like uh, big companies require FOC, they call it free of charge for to doing demonstrations which is not quite friendly for uh, innovators or young startups like us, which having very limited resources for doing that. And of course, it ends up to be the cost barrier. So uh, sustainable fashion often comes with higher price tag, which might deter price sensitive consumer. Um, in our case here, when we talk with, uh, or having conversations with small medium brands who are eager to uh, create a change, but having um, difficulties for accessing sustainable uh, materials or even because it's new materials, they sometimes they require uh, R&D before bringing it to the market. And subsequently, of course, creating accessibility, uh, limited accessibility for our end consumer uh, purchasing sustainable uh, fashion options. So. So that makes us more difficult to, to reach or become a mainstream product in the market. Yeah, I think that those are quite a barrier for us right now. Thank you, Adi. Arin, how about your side? 
Um, I think uh, one of the main uh, things is the lack of infrastructure. Uh, and I'm talking now about Cambodia. There is basically no industry besides the manufacturing of finished goods where uh, raw materials are made into other kinds of products that can be made into a bed. So there's no mills, there's no knitting, there's no nothing. Uh, so that makes it extremely difficult to do something else with the waste uh, or and or reuse it. Um, and it's got very much, uh, uh, it's linked with the, the tax and legal. That's, that's the other one. Um, at the moment, basically, we, we cannot do anything than incinerate. Uh, if we do other things, we're not allowed, you will be penalized. So there is no tax legal framework that would trigger investors to move into this area because as the company is operating it, you have an import export license, you're not allowed to do anything else. So that hampers any kind of uh, a future development, I think, on, on, a, on a bigger scale. So it's a moment that these kind of uh, uh, things are going to move a little bit and it is allowed to experiment on reusing or refabricating certain things without being penalized, then I think there will be um, a, a step forward, but that's not the case at the moment. Thank you, Arjen. And uh, as we are the policy support component part of the uh, Switch Asia, we are taking it very, very much on there uh, as a note uh, for uh, for our future work, so to remove the barriers to change on the policy level. With this, thank you very much uh, to our panelists. Uh, dear colleagues online and dear audience, please don't hesitate to put questions uh, to our experts uh, in the chat. And with this, uh, Sirasa, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sinaida. Next, we have panel discussion two on consumer awareness and behavior change towards slow fashion. Leading this panel is our key expert, Ms. Lorraine Gatlabayan, the key expert on SCP awareness, racing and regional partnership building at Switch Asia Policy Support Component. Joining her in the panel, there's three speakers. First, we have Ms. Katia Dayan Valadinirova, and then we have Ms. Sara Kare, um, sorry, apologies. So Ms. Katia is the founder and coordinator at the International Research Network on Sustainable Fashion and Consumption. And next speaker, we have Ms. Sarah Kare, the co-founder at the Cloth Circularity. And then the last, we have Ms. Elisa Arian Cardo's Loera, who is the CEO and creator of Remade in Cambodia. Everyone, please welcome all speakers and moderator to the spotlight. Okay, thank you, Sarasa. So we are now in panel discussion two, focusing on consumer awareness and behavioral change towards slow fashion. So this panel discussion will be focusing on the important role of consumer awareness and behavioral change towards fashion sustainability or moving towards slow fashion. So awareness and education of consumers are important. It contributes and push for making the fashion industry green. And as consumers learn about the environmental consequences of their clothing choices, they're making smarter decisions, choosing sustainable materials used and choosing brands that align with their values. And in slow fashion, customers are leaning more towards buying fewer, higher quality products that are used longer and eliminating the fast fashion throw away mentality. So we have, as mentioned, our three panels. So I will first start with Katya uh, Vladimirova. She's the founder and coordinator at International Research Network on Sustainable Fashion Consumption. Um, Katya, you have been active being in the forefront on pushing for sustainable fashion consumption and uh, providing extensive research and publication on how to transform the fashion industry towards sustainability. So based on your research and experience in the network, uh, what do you think are the drivers and the challenges for consumers to move towards circular fashion? Katya, you have to Thank you so much, Lorraine, and thanks for having me. Um, 
So I'm a researcher at the University of Geneva, and I've been focusing on fashion for the past eight years. Uh, previously, um, in my PhD, I looked at broader climate policies. I'm an ethicist by training. So now I'm applying that knowledge to understand how to transform social norms and our values towards sustainability related to fashion. And what we see is actually years of research from other domains than clothing and fashion that tell us that mere awareness of environmental issues or social um, negative impacts from a supply chain is not enough to convince consumers to buy better. And even more so, simply buying better is not the solution for the way forward. Why? Because we cannot green buy our way out of the crisis of overproduction and overconsumption that we're finding ourselves at. Um, I've uh, myself participated and written multiple studies around um, rethinking our system of consumption. And while circularity is definitely a critical central element in this conversation, circularity is the logic of um, ecosystems uh, re uh, uh, renewal of ecosystems that exists. It's a logic that is close to the planet, to the earth, but we also need to combine the logic of circularity with the logic of sufficiency. Like you said, Lorraine, we need to buy fewer things of better quality. So these are all drivers um, that are kind of uh, in, informing consumers about how to buy. Many people are buying into circularity by um, engaging into reuse. So we see that secondhand market of fashion is growing very rapidly. However, not all products that are entering secondhand are good quality. It can actually be reused for a long time due to the generally dropping quality of uh, ultra fast fashion and fast fashion garments. But we also see on social media and outside uh, quite a push from a subgroup of consumers um, towards living with less because having less in research and in empirical studies has shown us that having less clothes of all things um, uh, results in higher levels of subjective well-being or happiness. So people are moving towards having less clothes, um, shoes, accessories, because actually living with less, fewer, better garments makes them happier. So I would say these are roughly the directions around which uh, the discourse right now is, is evolving. Okay, thank you, Katya. So it's really important to emphasize that um, sustainable consumption, it's its really in different products. And the, the issue there, it, it's, it's, it, everyone plays a role from consumers to production to make, to make changes happen. And, uh, and for consumers to move towards sustainable lifestyle, living more with less. Thank you. And uh, now we move to Sarah uh, Kedash, she's the co-founder of Cloth Circularity. Um, uh, they collect, repurpose, and recycle used clothing. And uh, Sarah, could you tell us more about uh, Cloth Circularity, what you're doing, particularly on how you are raising awareness through consumer education, involving consumers uh, to catalyze the circularity in the textile product? Uh, in the, in the Thanks, space. Lorraine. Hi. Um, thanks, everyone, um, for attending this. A very good discussion. Um, Cloth Circularity formed and founded in 2013. And like, you know, 12 years ago, 11 years ago, it was almost unheard of about circular fashion, right? So when we formed the company, we were thought of, okay, we want to promote product made from sustainable materials and fibers, right? But it didn't happen according to what we want, simply because people doesn't know the problem statement. Why? Why they buy? What kind of material they buy? And what, you know, what's the effect at the end of its useful life? Right. So we re-strategize and rebrand our so we created Clockcast is actually a brand movement, is a voice. So it's a voice to raise awareness about textile waste, how to keep fabric in our country is landfills, not incinerators. So keeping fabrics out of the landfills with a five R philosophy, which is rethink. I agree with Katia. It has to start with rethink. How are you going to use your garment? Um, is it going to be repaired 
to reduce, reuse, repurpose, and recycle. So we have been telling our people, Malaysians and Singaporeans, right? We are operating in both countries. You have to rethink, and not every clothes are you know bad condition, and you have to recycle. You you there's few recycle is actually the last mile, right? And it um true recycling program. So we tell them, right, okay, in Malay, in our country, so people have this mindset, whenever they don't want clothes, they, they, they thought they donate and someone will wear it. But they forgot that, you know, demographics, the background, the needs um, are not the same. Like probably like we are multiracial, multi-diverse, uh, cultural, like people wearing scarf, no scarf, like long skirt, short skirt, like everyone like has a different needs so these are the things that we keep them like okay it's okay that you have you pass down that you know that who are the beneficiaries but what happened to those clothing that you don't know where to send to right so we um we have a cl cloth box recycling box and we tell them that if you send to us we will make sure that it doesn't go to the landfill right and how it will be processed same, 50, 55 to 60 percent of our clothing can still be reused. Uh, we are going through the network of, you know, we can repurpose. Uh, your water absorbent, uh, good materials can be turned into industrial wiping cloth. And we have mechanical separation. Cotton can be shredded into fibers to make into rods and home furnishings. And of course, you know, the, the ideal situation that we are waiting is technology textile to textile, uh, that we were perfect situation. Having said that, yeah, I mean, reduce, uh, having less garment is the way forward. And this is what we always inculcate to our uh, consumers or our audience. Five are rethink. How are you going to, you know, consume? Is it good for you? Or like who, who, is, who made your clothes? So those are the things that we promote to them, yeah. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Just an, um additional question to what you said. What do you think, what are the challenges that have you faced on, on, on raising awareness and encouraging consumers to take part in your initiative? Uh, first of all, like uh, we got a lot of questions, like we th people thought that we're just collecting clothes, but we are actually collecting uh, shoes, uh, luggage, home furnishings and all that. And um, okay, subsequent to that, the beauty of it, uh, people thought that we give it like you know we we give to someone right but it's actually it's a huge uh, fabric recycling network that we are working with like uh, say uh, we our traditional costume is called baju koro right like we can't send to say Indonesia or Thailand nobody gonna wear it so what we're gonna do is we re refurbish or repair and make it into like a short blouse and you know those countries who can accept it right and um, say in the lights of sport shoes, right? The sport shoes we will take and send to Pakistan, and this, you know, it will be the farmers going to use it instead of they are buying new sport shoes, so they can buy, you know, like a um more cheaper value, but they can still wear it to the farm, and even like one missing pair of flip flops, you can pair it and they will wear it to their farm, like it's their necessities, yeah. So it's really important to provide information on how they could participate in what you are doing with those yeah, materials. Our, our audience is very curious, like what happened, what happened. Like, so what we do is we do like beyond collection. So we report and we, you know, educate them, like, where does it go to? What is the purpose of it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Now we go to Alisa. Erin Cardos Loera, she's the CEO and creator at Remade in Cambodia, a sustainable fashion enterprise that aims to transform recovered textile waste into wearable products, empowering local designers and raising awareness in the fashion industry. So, Alisa, can you tell us more about the Remade in Cambodia? Uh, what are you doing to achieve this, Partic particularly on uh, consumer awareness and empowering consumers? Sure. Um, so I'll give some context behind uh, a little bit behind Cambodia and then our project first before going into consumers. Uh, but kind of so the situation that we're dealing with here and one of the things that Remade in Cambodia was really created for is that uh, is the simple fact that 20 percent of the waste that's in rivers is textiles. 
And that kind of represents a lot of key issues for us. Um, but we, what we found out after finding out that fact is that no one knew about it. So while of course, like we should go beyond education and awareness, we also wanted to empower people with the knowledge of what is happening in their own community as far as where textiles are going, um, the textiles that are being imported and what that circulation looks like, um, and especially where it's ending up and why it's ending up there, which is a question that we still you know, are discovering little by little. But um, what we do is, and it started off as an artistic project. We started with a fashion show. Um, one, because half of what we're concerned with is the textile waste that's affecting the rivers that support the wildlife in our community. Um, but the second is that we're concerned with what or what we saw was a lack, an extreme lack of Cambodian design within Cambodia itself. Um, and so, and we do believe that this goes into how we interact with our consumers too, which is um, slowing down, looking at more local design, um, designed by Cambodians, um, but also that's informing or providing a solution to this waste. So what we do now is we recover waste from the rivers um, and collect it from the community or we do a little bit of community collection, but it's mainly the waste that's coming from the rivers. Then we work with young Cambodian designers to upcycle it into fashion and now products. So we started off with this artistic angle of being very frustrated by the issue. Um, people of my generation, there's so many issues to kind of consider um, and it's developed that we've so much developed this term of eco-anxiety. And I feel like it's re it was really difficult to even start to think of how we would approach a number like all of these issues. And so we started with the arts because we felt that that was an accessible means um, for people to interact. And specifically, fashion shows are quite popular in this community. Um, so that's how we started um, with that artistic lens. But now what we're really focused on is how do we upscale upcycling? Um, and many people told us in the beginning that we couldn't, um, that it's not a viable solution. But looking at a very community focused model um, and a lot of partnership, that is what we've been working on in the last uh, year of our creation. So this idea, like while there's many, there's many um, places where we could collect the waste and um, like our, one of our colleagues was saying, or the, what they said in the last uh, panel is that it's mostly incinerated. What we've been doing is diverting that um, and providing upcycling it now. Okay, thank you, Alisa. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we discuss very much a uh, circular fashion and um, there's a lot of focus on recycling and also looking at innovative uh, solutions towards circularity. Uh, I want to ask Katya because um, a lot of uh, circular fashion strategies focus on the end part in terms of recycling and also refurbishing and so forth. And there are new opportunities for businesses for innovation and products in the fashion industry, focusing on efficiency, circularity, and substituting resources. So in your research, uh, based on our examples from Sarah and Alisa, how do you think can these initiatives be supported? and how they could scale up, not only looking at recycling, but also looking at the, the whole circular business model that uh, focus on efficiency in terms of production processes and operations and also sub, uh, 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 substitutions. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Thank you, Lorraine. And I just let me applaud Sarah and Alyssa for the work you're doing. It's really admirable. I'm, I'm always happy to learn about like good examples like these. Um, congratulations. I think that the most promising angle um, to take here to support initiatives at the level uh, that we have been presented now is the municipal level, the city level. Um, the level uh, when you still know your neighborhoods, when you still know people who are involved, but it's big enough that there is certain financing available and certain, you know, willpower that can transform local infrastructure and, and um, existing systems. I've uh, participated and given a keynote at a webinar a few months ago organized by the United Nations on the role of cities in sustainable fashion consumption in shaping it. And uh, what I see in our discussion today is like those insights are very relevant um, because cities have the capacity to support things that haven't scaled out yet outside of the national borders or outside of the city borders, but at the same time are able to create synergies among different actors which need, you know, help working, working together. 
of course, speaking about um, scaling, I, I'm a bit cautious about this conversation when it comes to slow fashion. The reason why fashion is fast today is because we've increased in efficiency to level 80, you know, like that's the ultimate level of efficiency, which actually disregards people and planet. It's so efficient. Um, so to me, going towards slower fashion has to do with uh, questioning these kind of efficiency ways of doing things and, and returning back to humans and returning back to the environment that needs to support our practices. So for me, slow fashion is not always scalable. There are certain artisanal practices that we just cannot scale to make them global. And I don't think we should. Um, there are lots of, there's a whole tapestry of really unique, very interesting initiatives that are all developing. I am more familiar with the European context. And, you know, I would love to learn more about the, uh, the Asian context, but people are coming up with solutions that are local answers to the local manifestation of a global problem. And I think this is the right way to go rather than developing one solution that we think should work for everybody because it, there is no one size fits all. It's culturally specific. It's uh, specific to, you know, the, the I don't know, the climate of the place. It's specific to uh, the, the kind of resources that the place has. Um, but I definitely see a lot of possibilities of pushing this dis discussion forward uh, at a level of cities, mayors, uh, maybe regional uh, collaborations of cities, exchanges uh, between Europe and, and Asia or African continent, uh, Latin America, South uh, global south to global south um, exchanges. There's a lot that we can learn from each other to be inspired. And uh, yeah, I believe that staying local, there is nothing wrong with staying local. It's, it's the good way to go. Okay, thank you, Katya. So from what I got from there is that there's a, an important role for collaboration and partnerships with other stakeholders that could support initiatives such as um, what Alisa and Sarah uh, uh, mentioned to us. So going back to Alisa and Sarah, what do you think is needed to support your work to towards the innovative and circular fashion solutions and how you can help support consumers to be involved and to choose uh, sustainable brands in the fashion industry? Uh, right. Uh, first of all, I totally agree with what mentioned by Kadia, like slow fashion um, and you talk about scalability uh, is really like they're not, they won't be best friends <laughs> because um, through material recovery, like what are the items that you can be repurposed and recycled uh, in our point of view? Because we do take a good and wearable garments and we make into upcycle gifts and merchandise. And the beauty of it that we call our brand is Cloth Woman Up. And we engage with uh, women from the marginalized community, the struggling communities that, you know, they can't go out for to work. And we gave them this material to make um, beautiful products. Right. Um, what are the initiatives that we actually encounter and uh, appreciate is a platform like this, um, just showcasing like let Alisa, you know, like I just learned about it like two weeks ago. Right. And it's really, really beautiful, like sharing stories. And also like um, we are also um, in support of SDG 17. That is more our key success factor. Uh, we have more than 1,000 network of partners and supporters in Malaysia and Singapore, uh, not just limiting in the government, but we work with brands as well. Uh, we take their, you know, access stock and we make into beautiful merchandise. Uh, so another initiative that, you know, we're looking at, I mean, on the local level would be, we are talking to the government um, in terms of government green procurement, which um, would be part of the working community, like how to move forward and support environment and social problems. And, you know, in terms of upcycling merchandise, right? Because um, in Malaysia, I mean, it's, I, I'm not sure about other countries. Um, we love to give gifts and merchandise uh, every events so be we have been working with a lot of event organizers um shifting in terms of you know um you know tote bags made from woven material right and it's virgin so they are been you know taking from our collected fabrics you know materials that can be used and make into bags yeah okay thank you sarah alisa 
Sure. Just um quickly on the note of scaling up, I think that when we, and like we've really embraced this like scaling up upcycling because it is like currently the way that um that we've been interacting with it is through a social media, uh, like it's done largely through social media or there's smaller, um you know, shops or even specifically initiatives that are doing upcycling. But I think when we talk about scaling up, we're really just looking at providing more jobs. Um, and that's how we're able to produce more. And so for us, it's an opportunity for, or it's an opportunity to provide jobs, especially within um, what we're dealing right now, which is jobs lo- or people losing jobs due to factory closures. And so for us, like the scaling up is a positive in that sense, but I can totally understand how in reaction to what fast fashion looks like now, it can be sometimes scary to talk about it. Um, but in the sense of what we need, I think is at least here and my experience, my personal experience in Cambodia is that we need a holistic approach that also involves youth. Um, the average age in Cambodia is 27. And a lot of the times, like when these discussions are had, they're very separated from youth. Um, and they're separated from like, are often just what I've experienced too, is that fashion and the actual dealing with textile waste are also very separated, at least um, in how I've experienced this field. And that actually embracing um, both are really, is a really, I think, important approach to both making it something that's interesting and exciting to talk about. I mean, everyone wears clothes and everyone engages in fashion in some sense. And so being able to engage people artistically and then also holistically looking at the issue and how it's um, affecting every part of the ecosystem, I think is important, especially when we intru- we're we really still introducing the concept of sustainability and building a sustainable future to education here. And so for me, it's not just textile waste or not just the circular, you know, and dare I say, like using even the term circular economy or circular fashion here, but it's really looking at um, building that sustainable future as a whole and how it's affecting every part. Okay, thank you. Thank you to our speakers. Uh, we reach our time, our time's up. So I I leave it back to Sirasa to continue the webinar. Thank you to all. Thank stars. you very much, Lorraine, Katia, Sarah, and Alisa. I'm so excited about, about the discussion today but we have one more panel discussion coming up before we head to Q&A. So I'd like to invite participants to keep the questions rolling into the chat box so that we have a fruitful discussion during the Q&A. So next, we have panel discussion three on driving systemic change in the fashion industry, innovation and partnerships. And welcome back to the spotlight is our team leader, Sinaida Fadiva, team leader at Switch Asia Policy Support Component. Joining her in the panel, we have Jemmy Gunawan, who is the head of circularity at Asia Pacific Rayon. Also, Mr. Wasin Tamrong Sekunwong, who is the director and general manager at Interhise PCL. Please welcome everyone to the spotlight. Thank you, colleagues, and what a pleasure to be together with you and discuss with Sin and Jemmy. Uh, colleagues on the uh, in the audience, you might have started already to notice that we had three distinguished panels organized around uh, quite different actors uh, and innovators in this uh, area. Some st- some interpreter- entrepreneurs with very innovative uh, s- ideas, uh, small and aspiring and growing. Uh, community-based uh, and this panel is specifically about uh, discussion with uh, people who represent companies which are rather established and rather large and are on a uh, journey to towards circularity quite convincingly and so uh, let me just start with uh, a more general question uh, to you uh, Vasin and to you Jamie what 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 is the circumstances uh, which provide either driving uh, impulses or uh, present obstacles uh, for you to become more circular, more resource efficient, uh, focus more on resource substitution, focus more on circularity of material and energy? What are the policy, international, na- national? What are the uh, conditions in the market which, which uh, drive you and generally drive the whole field? Uh, where you operate forward. Okay. Uh, thank you, Zinaida. Uh, and uh, first of all, I think uh, thank you for the same circular economy platform and Switch Asia for having here and for organizing this event. Uh, first of all, uh, let me explain a bit about uh, this Asia Pacific Ion. So, 
Asia Pacific Ion is a, a bio-based product manufacturer uh, based out in uh, uh, Riau province in Indonesia. And uh, we are actually the first Asia that uh, are having the uh, manufacturing facility uh, vertically integrated uh, from the uh, plantations up to fiber. And uh, as you know that uh, in APR, our operations, uh, in our operations, we are guided by five state bonding principles. So in uh, whatever we do, must be good for the community, the country, climate, customer, then it will only be good for the company. So by uh, using these founding principles, I think uh, we don't have any uh, challenges uh, in terms of uh, uh, like applying the circularity in our uh, In fact, uh, I could say that uh, we are almost aligned with all the uh, national and international policy. And we uh, are willing to help the other uh, stakeholders to, uh, uh, to, you know, to become more silver. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Jamie, what makes you do what you do in this direction? Is it market demand? Is it legislation? So, yes. Uh, I mean, like uh, we uh, follow all the international. Like for example, today uh, in 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 Europe, we know that uh, in Europe the uh, there is a new policy about the circular economy action plan. So, uh, we are following that plan, you know. And for any, uh, any, any, any standards that is good for the environment, we, we try our best to follow that. We are uh, try to comply with all that uh, requirements. So actually, uh, the basis of our, uh, the basis of our uh, uh, actions is based on that 5C founding principles. So with, with or without that the international policies, we are, uh, you know, we, we will comply with, uh, with anything that is good for the community, climate, and country. Excellent. So a combination of really principles of operation good and, and uh, standards which are emerging currently on the market. Excellent. How about you, Vasin? So we at uh, Interhive, we are one of the major leather manufacturer in the in the world. So to be be circular, you have to think of where the raw material comes from, right? I I, I understand in in the fashion world, there's a lot of talk about utilizing leather and the environmental impact it has, but we have to look beyond the, the manufacturing. Leather is generated from the meat business, right? We're eating meat from cows, from pigs, from sheep. Leather is then generated as a byproduct, right? So if we don't use it, it goes into landfill to, to waste. So at Interheis, we don't view it as we make leather. We're basically turning the supposed waste to be something that is usable, right? We're working with many stakeholders here, not just in, in Thailand, but also in the States, in Argentina, in Brazil, around the world, which generate meat and, and raise cows. Especially in Thailand, we have a couple of programs that we run with the local farmers who, you know, their livelihood is based on selling the cows or generating the most income possible from their effort of raising the cow for the past nine to 10 months. When we have a home for every part of it, then it becomes a true circular, right? 
the meat goes somewhere, the bone goes somewhere, the blood goes somewhere, then the leather goes somewhere. Yes, there are some a lot of challenges that we we face, but I think we are we're doing something that is trying to change the view of utilizing leather instead of viewing oh it's it's so harmful to the to the environment and to the economy and everything. We're trying to change that view, not just to our shareholders, but also to our customer that you're not just buying the leather, you're actually helping the big picture of the world, right? I, I, I don't think anybody would want to pay 15% extra for their beef. And, and we doing what we do, or not just us, but people in the industry of the leather business is, is trying to hold that price down as we generate another source of income for the for the meat business or a stable income for the meat business. Now, in terms of the policies and everything, yes, there's always policy in restricted substance, you know, labor, all those stuff. But for us personally, we always try to go beyond. We always look forward to what could be the possible change in the world, not just in Thailand, but in the in the global market. And we try to be ready before those legislations or those, you know, laws and standards are approved. And and I think our customer appreciate that that part. Excellent. What unites our two speakers is clearly a, a adherence to the higher norms and really forward thinking. Uh, so not only uh, orienting on the stick but also on the carrots. Which brings me to the next logical question. What are the innovations uh, in your companies which could be uh, illustrating some elements of circular economy or circularity uh, you can talk about? And uh, was in particular for you, my, my personal question. So the fact that you take, a, take so much care about um, input materials, uh, which are hides, well, the, the uh, skins, uh, uh, of the animals, that, did it, for example, change your relations with the suppliers and how they handle their businesses? Uh, yes, um, we 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 do have some procurement standard that we would like our uh, supplier to to follow, such as not using harmful preservative, all those stuff, and uh, the way of uh, you know skinning the cows. We would like it to be done as neat as possible so that that piece of leather will not go to waste, right? We we think that every piece is is very important. I I don't think you would want to waste your your skin. So we we treat the cows the same way as as we would do. So we should respect and we try to have our supplier reflect upon. Now in terms of technological advance and innovations, we have a we have a lot. Because uh, as you know, the leather industry is is viewed as a very dirty, dirty industry. But what we're trying to do here is to change that concept. We're trying to become zero waste, and we're now at around ninety five percent zero waste. We are just having some some remains, which we are working with our customer also to to make that happen. Now it's not just the innovation, because we have from you know recycling water, you know, uh, recovery of the protein of the leather scraps for fertilizers and for pet foods. There's a lot of things, but these are are not just a customer driven, but also our own, you know, philosophy driven. Excellent, Jamie. How about innovations, which we can uh, proudly show uh, from your company as elements of circularity? Uh, okay. Uh, as a company, APR uh, is aware uh, and about our responsibility. And, and actually, uh, we want to be the uh, sustainable uh, manufacturer and we want to be uh, uh, operate in a sustain, 
sustainably in a way, uh, including the circularity. So uh, in terms of innovation and circularity, we committed some funds actually to NDU in Singapore. So basically we want them to help us to uh, research and uh, design an urban fit uh, textile recycling park in Singapore. Okay. Uh, uh, why urban fit? Because operate in a city like with six million people. So once uh, they are able to design that uh, plan, uh, and if, if that succeeds, you know, we can put them in the in the in the, in the other big cities. So when uh, we collect the waste, we can immediately sort in the waste and then recycle it, recycle it, and then that recycle part we uh, can uh, send right away to where the pulp plant is and then to be mixed with the kitchen pulp. So uh, we hope that NPO can give us that plant. And uh, this is also a way for us to, you know, to secure the sustainable growth in our business. And uh, I think on top of this, we have our own R&D centers in, uh, in, in our plant in Riau. Uh, we have a very highly qualified uh, R&D technicians. Uh, currently, they are working now uh, uh, with the testing, uh, you know, various of textile waste. And uh, they are also trying to optimize the process, how to integrate 20% of uh, textile waste into our PSF uh, 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 raw feed. Uh, and then we, you know, with that uh, process, we also try to patent it, that process. And uh, thanks God, we got the approval for that patent process by early of uh, last year. Yeah, so I think that are, uh, those are a few uh, innovation that we have done in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Uh, what we know, colleagues, is of, of course uh, to come up with new practices uh, leading us to circular economy, uh, to be more efficient, more circular, work with alternative products, uh, innovations are quite uh, critical and what our two uh, speakers are saying is exactly that uh, for them this is a one of the very significant components of the business and i wanted us to to really note it uh, because some of the transformations which we look for would not be possible without quite serious investment to research and development either on the side of the companies or with uh, through certain governmental policies, so it's not something which uh, which would happen just by doing things better within the current framework. So thank you very much for for uh, emphasizing it through your practices. And what uh, what also is quite important in our session is called driving systemic change uh, uh, through innovation and partnership. Uh, let me just ask you about those partnerships which you feel have been playing quite significant role uh, for you or partnerships which you might need to uh, do your your business and your job in circularity much more ambitiously. So what are those? Okay, uh, we we have a program which is uh, spearheaded by, by us and one of the shoe brands in, in, in London. It's a uh, Vivo Barefoot. So they have a concept that they would like to help small stakeholders. We also had a concept of wanting to generate income for our supplier locally to guarantee some sort of a economic stability, right? So in the shoe industry, there's a lot of talk about 
the material needs to look nice and clean. While these farmers in Thailand, they they are not those big farms where the cows are, you know, in a nice box and and living peacefully without any trees to scratch them. They're living in the in the wild with you know the farmers most of the time in the houses. So it tends to have some more natural defects. Then the brands think that that is a, a key point that they can really, you know, display that these leather are not from, you know, big farmers. These are from small stakeholders that they would like to support, you know, give fair price and everything. So that's a program that I think it's part of us driving it and also our customer embracing it. It's not really an innovation in, into it. It's just more in uh, our customer marketing it and, and you know, putting the effort into to accepting these, you know, changes and, and allowing us to, to do that, which has been going on for four years already and it's going strong. And our farmers are very happy and, you know, having stable economy, stable income. They're very happy. That's just one of the, the programs which, which has been going on for a couple of years. Interesting. We think this is, in a sense, a good collaboration between development uh, institutions or NGOs, or I, yeah. I'm not quite sure what their, their status is, and the businesses. And uh, we see it as quite a promising way of going forward. In fact, uh, also for the colleagues from the previous panel, it's it's quite a good, uh, maybe, uh, analogy uh, because quite a lot of uh, community <clears throat> developed products also thrive on the success of the design and those are the analogies which we could see so design is everything and particularly for a specific uh, for, for specific markets and with a specific uh, message thank you very much demi uh, yes, uh, I think uh, talking about the partnership in Indonesia, uh, APR uh, engaged with many, many stakeholders, with associations, uh, with the retailers, with gun manufacturers. Uh, and uh, I think one uh, of the key partnerships that we uh, have achieved so far is like only Rantai Textile Lestari. So Rantai Textile Lestari is in, in, in Bahasa, in, in, in uh, English, is Sustainable Textile Change. So basically, we, together with uh, two other upstream suppliers and two uh, downstream uh, textile company and two uh, non-profit organizations are forming these organizations. So, uh, we use this uh, platform basically to to uh, to uh, share the experiences and uh, best practices uh, to implement you know the joint action towards uh, sustainable issues in Indonesia. Uh, what else then? Uh, what's more is that we are also collaborating with one of the biggest. Uh, uh, Fashion retailer in Indonesia. We are, uh, you know, working with them to implement the uh, textile waste management systems in Indonesia. So basically, we 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 place like forty six of drop box in four big cities in, in Indonesia, and then we uh, set up a logistic infrastructure how to collect. Uh, those ways from the end consumer in 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 the most day, uh, efficient way, and then we send it to our sorting partner, and uh, they will uh, segregate the, the ways you know based on the uh, 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 based on the category of the post consumer bills you know like available non available, and then we also like uh, check the fiber compositions of. Uh, each garment that we 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 are collect uh, we collect and then we uh like do the debuttering, debuttering, uh and we separate all the uh, all the plastic material from those garments. Uh, I believe that the the the, the idea of this uh 
but implementing the, the risk management system is like to, you know, to, uh, to uh, make the value of the freeze becoming higher and also the optimize to optimize the end use of that those ways thank so, you very much Jamie. Uh, sorry you didn't finish uh, please go ahead yeah so uh anything that is come within uh, our pit stop specification we will collect it later if once our uh, recycling pump is ready and uh, that is the you know the ultimate goal uh, another goal is like we want also to help the community uh, how to, uh, you know, uh, optimize the utilization of those ways. Like, for example, maybe for uh, uh, for ways that is mm, not able to uh, uh, this, uh, recycle, then we will send the, those ways to the community so they can, like, uh, uh, Tearing it away and then use it as a fiber pillar, like for bed or pillow. Uh, Jamie and uh, Vasin showed us uh, again both uh, both sides of the supply chain from issues of design and sourcing materials until waste, but not only waste collection and separation, but also considerations how to put them. Uh, into into the system, and though you belong to different different sectors, you you are acting on a similar philosophy, covering uh, within circularity as a whole of a supply chain with attempt to make it uh, closed and leak proof. Uh, now, Siras, I know we are to uh, surrender the panel to you with big thanks to the audience, but before we do, can I just maybe? slowly transit to the questions uh, and answer session uh, and then after a couple of minutes uh, turn it uh, to you you just uh, can maybe um, uh, prepare but uh, because the reason is because uh, it's already happening uh, some matchmaking with help of the colleague uh, uh, thank you very much Rita Brato so you you are mentioning that I was suggesting to Pavisi, uh, to Kunvisin, um, to maybe see if uh, collaboration with uh, Pak Adi from uh, MYCL, uh, who makes leather out of the mushroom, uh, whether that's something which could be either part of your uh, <clears throat> branching, or at least if you potentially could maybe uh give contact to your london uh development entity to him for uh in case it's it's required for for some uh interesting um uh, design and 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 branding development options uh but generally can i just uh, Sirasa, can i just leave us all with one question which also inspired by the question previous question to pa adi uh, where the question was to what extent the quality of your product is is matching the current uh, quality of the quote unquote conventional uh, leather. However, we see now that leather is not all leather is the same. Is it equally durable? Is it competing in terms of quality and uh, resilience in the face of uh, different weather or conditions or different environmental pressures? And generally, for all of our colleagues, to what extent? quality of your products are competing with conventional products and to what extent the design of your products uh, is of significance. Uh, Sirasa, I would just ask you maybe to bring all of the uh, all of the panelists on board to focus on those questions because those are probably most interesting and important and very often questioned by the broad and not so very aware audience. Sirasa, over to you, but from my side, big thanks to uh, to Vasin and to Jamie and to all of the uh, colleagues. And the two questions are with you. Thank you very much, Sinead, for picking the questions. Perhaps I'd like to invite all the panelists to turn on your camera so that you can be um, spotlighted um, to join us on the stage. 
Um, perhaps in the order of the question, I'd like to reverse it a little bit before um, Inter Heights to answer whether or not they can help collaborate. Perhaps I would like to ask um, Adi first on the question that um, about the quality of your leather, of um, how durable is your leather and um, how long does it last? Is there a weak point? Perhaps heat will break it down faster. And also, also have your leather being produ um, produced into um, commercial products such as um, shoes and so on. Adi, are you still here with us? Adi, are you still here with us? There you go. Okay, so Adi, would you like to answer about um, your leather? That's the first point. Yes. Um, regarding the uh, performance, so of course, um, we try to be making the leather at least for a footwear standard, um, small leather goods. So, for example, like this material here, having the same flexibilities, uh, vibrations, and then uh, tensile strength, refer to the Footwear standard. Um, is um for all participants for our speaker is Adi um connections um a little bit robotic to you as well or is it only to me? Is it okay? Is this connection okay? Okay, great. So um so you you d I didn't quite get a lot of that. So you did answer of um so so how long does the this um Mylia leather um last yeah so for example like this uh, small wallet here so it's already uh -huh. uh, four years already uh, i wear it every day mm -hmm. put it in my pocket getting wet getting uh, sweat still mm -hmm. okay no significant damage so in terms of um replacing conventional leather for small leather goods it's uh quite surprisingly quite Durable and because we don't use PU PVC uh, on top of it, so there's no issue on the build up uh, or cracks during the usage. Okay, and um, and does is there a weak point to your leather? Does it um doesn't do well in moisture, or does it not do well in heat, or? Yeah, surprisingly, on in terms of the uh, material characteristic, the leather, I mean, the mycelium or the mushroom leather can stand high temperature because I think uh, you also notice when you cook mushrooms, it's never overcooked. So uh, because these thermal properties is contributed by the uh, hyphen on the composition of the mycelium leather. So we boil it up to 100 degrees during the post treatment process and there's no significant damage on it. So on um, temperature, high temperature, it's having more resistance. And then of the uh, water, yes, if I put a water on it, so it won't dissolve anytime soon. And then even I put it in my pocket getting swept uh, every day uh, in the humid conditions like Indonesia, um, still, um, no significant damage. Wonderful. And I don't know if you answered this already, but has your um, uh, mycelium leather been produced into commercial products other than this wallet, that this wonderful wallet that I see? Yeah, um, we have several items uh, in our web store, uh, small leather goods, uh, handbag. We also work collaborations with um, um, companies uh, big companies uh, for in our website you can when I mean, you can purchase it uh, either you can purchase it in the this format or the end product format so yes it's uh, virtually available right now thank you thank you very much for clarifying um, on your product then i like to move over to Kunvasen to the question and is it possible for you to help um, um, Adi's company perhaps in partnership or or, or collaboration and so on. Is there an opportunity that you see? Yeah, it's a, it's always a possibility. I, I do have a 
a peeve against calling anything that's not from animal leather. So, so it's a we need to find a term because uh, most of our customer do not like to call the alternative, you know, vegan material leather as they like in in Europe. There's a a legislation that's getting passed that if it's not from an animal, it cannot be used the term leather in the marketing material. So they're trying to find a term that can be called for these, you know, cactus, pineapple, mushrooms. You know, it's uh but the question I often have is how sustainable is is these, right? If the industry would change towards say mushroom, as we have a mushroom material maker here, how much mushroom would you have to grow? Right. And how much of an environmental impact is that as you are now growing probably thousands of acres of mushrooms? That's going to generate a lot of, you know, food waste because these are actually going for, for food, but you're, you're utilizing it for another thing. So those are the questions I normally get when, when, uh, because we we try to partner with a a pineapple material in the past and and that's what they asked us like okay yeah yeah you can make a certain amount what happens when we need x amount how are you going to source the pineapple what is the environmental impact the cows is one thing because it's a byproduct of the meat industry so they don't really view it as we need to raise the cows to generate leather it is already there for us to utilize if we choose to, but these alternative sources is uh, something that we'll need to have an answer for. Like, okay, when we look at the, you know, if you, for example, if you want to go for our brand, uh, our partner brand, they use around 200,000 200, square feet of material every every month. Let's say half of it. How much mushroom is is that gonna impact? And they're gonna ask you like, okay, what does it take to generate that? Is it really you know sustainable now when we are growing these mushroom for for this purpose? So yeah, it's it's a possibility, but we'll have to you know kinks out all the possible challenges and questions to to answer. Yes, performance is is one thing, but right now. It's all about, you know, where does the material come from? Thank you very much, Convastian, for all of these um, advice and then very important points to perhaps for NYCL to think farther and to have answer um, to scale up, I, I would say. Um, now, moving forward before we uh, be too late, um, I'd like to pass on the question, the last question that Sinaida left us for the rest of the four panel that are here with us is that uh, the comparison of your product in terms of quality and design to conventional product. Um, I would like to um, invite perhaps, um, Arjun, would you like to start? I will unmute. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the quality is uh, because we, we use recycled uh, polyester and then we use very specific non-water uh, non dyeing processes because dyeing is one of the most environmental um, damaging process of the whole supply chain in that sense. Um, and that technique is actually excellent. Uh, so there's no uh, there's no issue there uh, for us and what we see um we moved to give you a kind of a number uh, from let's say 2018 until now so five six years um more than half our portfolio is now recycled uh, and and we use these new dyeing techniques and i think that in two three years it will be 90 percent. so it goes quite fast once the traction is there once the and and there's another problem i mean I, I there was this discussion about scaling and i completely agree but the other issue is that scaling you need to get it to a reasonable quality and price um and um it is also i mean um if you compare of course we we say this from europe the rich west that scaling is bad 
But I think in many countries here in Cambodia, people just try to get access to certain things. And you can only provide those kind of things if they are scaled and a certain quality. So there's, it is also a bit of a difficult discussion uh, sometimes, I think, because there's more things than only the environment. There's also the social aspect, uh, people getting indeed employment and uh, getting a reasonable income and so on and on. But uh, to go back, I don't think it's a big problem. Uh, quality and pricing is 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 nearly the same at the moment. So it is, it would be strange if you don't choose for those options, to be honest. Amazing. Thank you so much. Next, I would like to um, invite Jimmy. Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Vanessa? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. So the question, so it will be the same question is um, in terms of uh, your sustainable um, alternatives uh, product, how can you compare the quality of these alternative products and um, the design of these um, product in comparison to conventional ones? Well, uh, we haven't uh, stopped any, 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 any recycled product. In, in Indonesia, so we just uh, started the pilot because you know textile uh, textile to textile recycling is not uh, an easy process. You know there are various of uh, textile waste, and we have to uh, ensure that uh, all those textile waste are meeting with our big stock uh, specifications. Uh, however, uh, we uh, can claim that. Uh, today, the the fiber uh, product that we uh, produce now is coming from the sustainable processes. Uh, why? Because we uh, currently are measuring all the you know clean manufacturer uh, performance using the UVAT standards. So UVAT standards is the best available tactics. Basically, uh, this all these techniques are uh, used to, you know, minimize uh, impact on emissions as well as uh, impact on the environment. So, yeah, Sirata. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, now, next, same question to you, Sarah. Um, we are pretty much, um, okay, so our operation mostly on the collection of the textile. Um, I think 50% of our operation covering, um, you know, recovery of materials from the, you know, public, from the industry players, uh, from the brands. Um, and we have a lot of questions as well, like, can we recycle leather? So something that you know uh, we would like to explore in terms of recycled leather uh, number two in terms of art cycling materials uh, merchandise and gifts uh, moving forward um, we are expanding in terms of a uh, number of ladies involved so currently we have in, engaged with like more than 30 um, 30 ladies and we are going to we have programs in singapore as well so it will go up double uh, by the end of the year. Um, in terms of, um, you know, this, I mean, security is a journey. So if we focus on collection, then repurposing and upcycling. And the next big question for us for cloth is, how do we recycle material? Like how Jamie mentioned, like from rayon, uh, how to recover and get the right material fixed up and turn it into a new material, right? So we have been receiving a lot of inquiries, uh, something that we work with the technology partners have to move forward in terms of polyester, cotton, other materials that Jamie mentioned just now as well. So that is uh, part of our journey to complete our security. Yeah. I believe to um, the question to how to recycle um, leather. I mean, I, I see cases all the time where leather was like strips from, you know, like train, um, car seat to be made into furniture or to be made into something else or in the case of um, interhides here they um, do recycle leather into protein and to reuse um, um, heavy metals into the um, processing of the leather as well. Um, Kunwasin, do you have anything to add on recycling leather? 
uh yeah there's a lot of talks about you know not really recycling but you know biodegradable leather as you know leather is a natural material uh what we put in is actually what is making it not biodegradable we're trying to find the the right mix as some of uh, our panels has discussed about finding the right balance to to make it still you know biodegradable but sturdy enough to to withstand the the use of the the public so we uh, was in sorry i mean if i can just you know like since we are you're there and um, like i have received a lot of questions from the luxury brands right they use a good wearable ladder that they want to discard and they want to find a solution like what they can do uh not really biodegrading but probably like use their material and turn into a new material for you in your processes like is that something that you're looking at as well uh yes we there's a way to repurpose those things but when it comes to like already used material, the pieces are very small. Mm. And that becomes a, a challenge to, to utilize. What like shoe brands are, are heading towards is making the shoe kind of be able to separate itself and then, you know, repurpose different parts of it. For example, if you have a sneaker, you know, the surface of the shoe would still be desirable to you, but the sole is just were worn off so they're designing something that you can replace a sole and then still use the the other material as a new shoe you know these are concepts as are being discussed but it's i would say a little bit a stretch as of right now as the the customer side is still not really accepting that reduction of the strength of the product they're still wanting you know the product will last as long as possible, yeah. which then result in, you know, having extra chemicals and extra process input it in. But I think there's a, we can see there's a transition in some of the brands, which are putting a lot of effort into lowering that standard so that their product is more environmental friendly. Their product is easier to be recycled, like maybe easier for, for you to utilize in, in the, in the future. But it's heading towards that way. Yeah. Right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kubasin and Sarah. It's such an inspiration to hear. Is Alisa still with us? Alisa? Are you still with us here? Okay. If not, then I'd like to circle back to Adi. Obviously, you already talked about the quality and, and the design of your product. Perhaps you'd like to very quickly touch upon... Um, the production method that Kunwasin has has questioned on whether or not do you have to grow mushroom and you know compete with the with the the food security to make your leather or whether your leather is made from perhaps byproduct from the mushroom industry or um please yeah uh, I think that's a really good question uh, so the misconceptions when we're talking about the mushroom leather is uh, it's coming from mushroom but it's it's not uh, we only use the mycelium just a small part of the mushrooms that grow in the agricultural waste. So the main uh, raw materials is coming from agricultural waste, which uh, we don't cut new trees. It's, an, uh, it's not a virgin materials. We collect it from, from the farmers. Uh, usually it's end up in the, in the land and somehow it's potentially become a, a, a haze, like burn and become haze. Uh, so we try to convert the agricultural waste and use a small, small, tiny of mushrooms uh, to grow this mycelium leather. We harvest it by peeling it off from its surface and do the post treatment. So, uh, so basically, we don't compete with food. Even the raw material itself is not coming from food. Um, and the second one is, uh, of course, when we're talking about how to scale this thing, is uh, uh, we can grow it vertically, doesn't require huge plant. Um, we can, compared to animal leather, of course, uh, one compared to 1,000 square meter of land to grow one square foot of mycelium leather. So it's scalable. Of course, uh, we I do believe it's not replacing the animal leather or conventional le uh, or synthetic leather. It's just an alternative for the other transitions into 
uh, more, yeah, have a uh, better options or other options. Uh, of course, we uh, need to work with existing industry, especially here, ITC. Of course, we had a lot of inquiries coming from um, uh, automotive OEM. Um, recently, we worked with Hyundai and Singapore team to, to convert their EV car seat. Of course, it's just a demonstration, but when we're talking about the uh, scalable, uh, how to scale it, of course, we, 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 we need to work with the existing industry. Uh, otherwise, it's impossible for us to, to scale. Thank you very much, Adi. I'm so glad to circle back to you. So thank you very much, all the speakers. Now we would like to re-invite the chairs back to the spotlight to give a closing to our webinar. Thank you, Sirsa. I'm, it was quite um, quite thought-provoking, I think, uh, because um, uh, just very briefly, I think one of the key things I've taken from this discussion is that we have to rethink. Uh, we have to rethink our system of consumption, which was discussed earlier, you know, and perhaps we have to find a balance on the way that we consume and find that delicate balance. Uh, the concept of less is more or less is happiness, you know, uh, is that acceptable to all? You know, would it relate to durable products and, and less consumption? So, and the final thought I had was that the local manifestations of a global progress. I think Katoya, who's left, the, who's left the, the, the meeting, had mentioned that in the sense that, um, um, is it possible to scale up? Or maybe it's not necessary to scale up, but to have local manifestations all over the place as, as a form of a global progress. So I think these are issues which um, We've had this, and interesting that, interestingly, that Catalia had mentioned this as a, as a European perspective and wanted to learn from an Asian perspective. And I found that quite interesting because uh, here in ASEAN, that's the way we were not many years ago. You know, uh, less is more, and you know, everything was circularity. So, so I found that actually interesting that, uh, you know, as a researcher in, in, in Europe, you know, she, was a, she was expressing this concept and perhaps we should be rethinking our own concepts, which was just, I would say, 25 years ago and see, to find, and see how we can find that balance. So with those concluding remarks, I'd just like to um, congratulate all of you and especially um, uh, our presenters that are working in Cambodia and Indonesia and Thailand. And I'd, I'd like to ask David to say a few words about where we where we are from here and where we take from here from our uh, stakeholder platform. David. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for your your uh, concluding remarks, Dr. Anthony. My key takes away resonates with the acknowledging the fashion industry's significant environmental footprint, which raised concern. But I'm not pointing finger here. We are all here. Good guys and girls. However, from our discussion today, a profound sense of hopefulness emerged. There is plentiful of knowledge, willingness to act from various types of and sizes of stakeholders, creative and artistic solution, as well as innovation to drive change. And thank you so much for Dr. Sirasa, our MC, that the knowledge summary of this session will be summarized and shared afterward. And please, Stay tuned to our webinar series in the following months, as well as upcoming activities, including ASEAN Business Green Procurement in August and the second ASEAN Circular Economy Forum in October in Bangkok, the Kingdom of Thailand, and much, much more. And have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tony and Kun David. Um, I'd like to express my sincere heartful thank you for all the participants that stay with us from the beginning until now and all the speakers that have taken time out of their busy schedule to come educate us, us today, as well as our chairs for making this event happen, our all moderator, moderator from our team for making this event happen. Um, additional to the events that Kun David has said, um, please keep an eye out for our fifth webinar in the series. Um, that we will be um, start um, the promotion soon. So thank you so much for joining us today. Everybody, please have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.